Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, on Valentine's Day. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's seminar. Uh, so my name is Rayan Klom, and I am the Dean's Chief Ambassador for the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to today's seminar titled Winning Big for Workers Through Politics and Policy. This event is part of the UCR School of Public Policy Community Seminar Series, where we bring the policymakers, the practitioners, and the researchers back to campus to speak about various public policy issues. This is also a part of our first alumni spotlight event where we bring notable UCR public policy alumni back to campus to speak about their inspiring work. In terms of the format of today's event, we will have our guest speaker present for about an hour. Afterwards, I will return to the podium to help navigate our audience Q&A with our guest speaker. For those joining us virtually today, I ask that you please input your questions via the Zoom's webinar Q&A feature. And for those joining us in person, please feel free to walk up to the middle aisle during our audience Q&A and speak directly into the mic uh, loud and clear so that those joining us via Zoom can hear you as well. So without further ado, without further um, delay, uh, without further delay, at this point, I am now delighted to introduce you all to our guest speaker for today's event, Umar Sohail. Umar Sohail works for Senator Lola Smallwood Cuevas as a policy analyst and serving nearly over one million constituents uh, of Senate District 28, which includes South Los Angeles and Culver City. His policy expertise lies at the intersection of labor and climate and focuses on creating good green union jobs for a just transition. Umar grew up in Southern California in a low immigrant fam low income immigrant family family where both of his parents worked hard to provide for him and his three sisters. Before working for senators for the senator's office, he worked as a researcher for both the UCLA Labor Center and UAW Region 6 to strategize leveraging public dollars and grassroots pressure to combat occupational segregation and grow unions. Umar holds a BA in public policy from the UCR School of Public Policy and a master's in urban and regional planning from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Policy. We are so excited to welcome him here back to campus tonight. Please join me in welcoming now uh, Umar Sohail to the stage. Thank you so much. I should just keep that there. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good. Good. Nice, warm, or cool ish day, dry, cold. Um, you know, uh, so just, just like straw poll, how many of y'all are undergrads? Okay, so I'm speaking to the right crowd. And how many of you are like in your first year? Cool. Second year, third year, fourth year. Nice. Okay. And grad students, anyone here? Okay. Cool. I was that just last year. So not, not too long ago. Any, um, uh, any folks who, um, maybe want to share why they're, why they, why this seminar spoke to them or why they're, why they wanted to come here, you know, just spitballing that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. It's legit. Yeah, totally. Mark, you had your hand up. Uh, my first graduate degree was in, at the time, public administration in NPA. So I'm interested in government and how this is all, and, and the, so the School of Public Policy, when it evolved and so forth, I was interested in it and kind of stayed in touch. That's great. Yeah. Anyone else? It's a bit falling. I'm just interested in the topic, uh, economic development and work, coming from manufacturing, I was a manufacturing engineer. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in changing to the public sector and wanted to see how labor with the world is that's awesome. Liam? I think it's uh, really important to advocate for workers in their unions and protecting their civil liberties. So just learn more about it. And yeah, absolutely. Um, I was drawn to this work. Um, one of my really cool, the people who brought me into it is sitting right there is Violetta. Um, so, 
you know, just, uh, you know, a lot of, um, I think it's, it's like a, it's a type of thing where like, it's relationship based, you know, it's really kind of built on trust, on mutual engagement, mutual endangerment, I think in a way people's interests converge, but also like, you know, other things. So yeah, cool. Um, so this is just going to be the rundown of the um, of the seminar today. Uh, I'll start off with a little bit about me, a little bit about what I did in undergrad. I'm not just a UCR SVP alum, but I'm also um, I studied abroad. I went to UCDC. I was in this program called PPIA that was really cool. And um, I think I think people don't know about these programs, and it, they, you know people don't know people who've done them. So I want to really share that with you all and um, let you know that. It's, you know, that there's a world outside of Riverside and there's, you know, there's things that affect it and it's good to go out, but also to come back if it, if it makes sense for you. Um, also going to talk about, you know, I'm going to just frame the the sort of seminar, the knowledge part of it in, in a couple, you know, neat categories, but they, they sort of spill into each other, right? And um, you'll notice a lot of there. You'll notice quotes. You'll notice parentheses. You'll notice question marks. And that's just me doubting. You know, kind of recognizing that I'm making assumptions in certain cases, right? Like, so an imperfect quote unquote solution, right? Um, but okay, so that's the problem. All right, so the intractable problem that that you know sort of faces a lot of unions and a lot of the folks that I work with um, is this offshoring of union jobs and occupational segregation. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what that is. Um, and then imperfect solutions, right, in response to um, things that are happening at a broader level. I'm talking about imperfect because they don't always work, right? Um, so what that is is a community benefits agreement. It's, you know, local hire programs. Um, but it, it's, you have to understand that people operate in the context of which they're in. You can't change your situation always, but you can change your tactics, you can change your strategy, you can change your target, you know, whatever. Um, and then, you know, a potential opportunity, right? Where, where we're in with this Biden and Biden-Harris administration, where we are with, um, you know, uh, um, with leveraging uh, money that's going towards the advanced manufacturing sector, right? Um, and, and every state's looking at it a little differently, but I'll, I'll talk about how my um, my boss, Senator Smallwood Cuevas, is addressing it, um, who was actually recently named chair of the Labor Committee in, in Sacramento, which is kind of a really big deal for a first-term senator. Um, and uh, I, I'm just like blown away. I'm like, oh my God, who am I working with? Who am I working for? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but, you know, um, just, just some of the things that, that are going on in Sacramento and, and things to keep on your mind. And then I want to leave ample time for Q and A, um, and I'll be around. I'm really approachable. I'd like to think um, I just wore a tie because um, you know this is me respecting the school that kind of brought me up. But you know, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not pretentious. I promise. Um, so this was me, uh, 19 years old. Um, I'm from Corona, California. How many of you guys? It's right next door. How many of you guys are from Corona? I feel like there's always. No, okay. Sometimes people show up and like you're from Corona and UCR and like that's just the symbol of our city is the crown. Um, so that's me. Um, I went to Centennial High School, was always very interested in policy and politics. Um, started off volunteering with the American Cancer Society of all groups um, and, you know, just kind of learned about politics, you know, wherever I could. I don't come from a political family. Um, like I mentioned, my family um, is low income, you know, um, still, you know, we don't have, we don't own our home, you know, we, we were renters, um, but still, you know, um, I think that really influences who I am and how I see the world. And I think that's, that's something to emphasize when you're in this field, you know, play your strengths, you know, don't, don't try to, don't try to change who you are. Don't try to, you know, try to, um, you know, feel like you have to mask to, to, you know, keep up with some waspy status quo, like you are you and then play it. Um, one of the things that I did really early on that influenced my trajectory is uh, do the UCDC program. Um, this I, I entered for Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Um, if you don't know, she's running for Senate now, but um, you know, she represents the um, uh, Oakland in, in uh, Congress. So, uh, you know, 
someone who's this was before like AOC was in was in elected. So this was probably she was the most progressive member at the time. She was the only member who voted against the Iraq war, for example, and um, still kind of that's her legacy. Um, and she stands on peace. Um, and, you know, I don't know who you're voting for um, for Senate, but um, it'd be cool to have a black woman as a senator. So that'd be great. Um, I'm holding that flag because it just fell down one day. Um, and I was an intern, so my job was to get the newspapers for all the staffers. Um, you know, it was not a glamorous job, but it taught me a lot just being in the space, you know, and um, that's probably how you're going to start off if you want to do something like this. You know, you'll, you know, do a lot of, um, do a lot of the grunt work, but it teaches you and it builds character. It's like, you know, like we would, we would joke, like, um, get a real job, like you're not even paid, but it was fun. Um, and then this was actually a couple months later um, when I took this selfie with her. She's like, I remember you. I'm like, you probably don't, but that's cool. Uh, and then this was just me dancing around the city. Um, this was the Supreme Court. These are the National Archives. Um, I don't know what this building was, but um, it looked cool. So, you know, I was just hovering around. Um, DC is a wonderful place to learn. Um, so go, you know, and I would highly recommend going in your last quarter so that, you know, you can stay there and find a job, you know, and then come back and then work again. So um, I did it in my second year. So it was kind of like a little anticlimactic when it ended, but I think I came back with a lot. Um, and then a couple in my third year, in the summer of my third year, I did this program called public called the Public Policy and International Affairs Fellowship. Um, and this was at the Goldman School of Public Policy, which is in Berkeley. And um, what this program does is that it puts you on a fast track towards grad school. So um, it, you know, gives you, I got waivers to all the schools I went to. I got uh, for applications. I got $5,000 in, in an automatic scholarship. If you go to some schools, you get a full scholarship. You got, you know, it's the, Car it's Carnegie Mellon that gives you a full scholarship for it. Um, I didn't want to go to, um, I don't want to be in Philly, so, I, but then I ended up, this, this got me in, into UCLA, I think, I'd like to think, um, and I ended up really only applying to, like, three schools, um, it was Berkeley, USC, and um, UCLA. When you apply to grad school, you want to find the programs that really match what you're looking for, and you got to be real about what you want when you apply to grad school, um, you know, you don't go in thinking, like, oh, I'm going to explore, I'm going to do this, you know, you're like, it's, it's, it's a big deal because, you know, you, you sh hopefully by the time you finish your bachelor's, you, you know what you want to do. And, um, you know, it, it, they don't give you as much financial resources for it either. So, um, you know, I, I took on some debt, but um, all for good measure. And these were my cohort members. Um, we still stay in touch today. Um, we went on hikes. Um, I was a little bald back then. I think it was like a spiritual thing. Um, I'm trying to grow out a mullet. So, you know, going the other way around. Uh, these are pictures from me studying abroad. Um, this is my friend, Danya. She went to UCI. Um, this was her eating soup. Um, and I just really like that photo. So I asked her permission to show it. Um, this was in the Netherlands, um, you know. So I don't know, I was talking about it right now. And I was like, yeah, they have a blackface holiday. Like they still, they in parts of the Netherlands, they still wear blackface to celebrate Christmas. And it's you know, and a lot of progressive, you know, Dutch people like oppose that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's still some people who cling on to it. Um, but in other ways, they're very progressive. You know, they have excellent family leave policies. They have great transit systems. They have great infrastructure. You know, um, uh, you know, I biked everywhere I went. Oh, my God, that was amazing. Um, but it just, you know, goes to show that things are complex and people are complicated. And I was like, oh, God, like, does America want to be exactly like Europe? I don't know. But in some ways, yeah. So I don't know. That that added a lot of nuance to my perspective. And this was in the Louvre. Um, I think like right now I'm talking about like, oh, it's amazing. It was awesome. But at the moment, that was more of my attitude. I was like, I was like, oh, why am I doing this? What am I doing here in Europe? You know, I want to be with my, my people um, organizing and stuff. But I'm glad I took some detours on my route in, you know, and I'm glad I didn't. I was on track to graduate in three years, but this is what I did in my fourth year. You know, I kind of just went back and forth. And I'm really glad I did that. I don't think I don't think people think to do that. I think I think what you need to think of your undergrad years is like it's not transactional, right? You're not just trying to find a job. You're building a knowledge base. You want to be transformative. You want to do things that kind of 
put you on a path, you know, but you you decide it. Um, I'm just showing you pictures now, but this is me on the Eiffel Tower, um, you know, um, everyone, all the tourists take the elevator, take the stairs. No one, no one goes, no one uses the stairs. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then this is me with a bunch of, um, you know, friends just on our bikes. I didn't take enough pictures on bikes and that that's really sad, but, and I think it's their sound. They're saying say cas, which is Dutch for cheese. So that was the fun part. But then all throughout this, in my senior year, I was also a Chancellor's Research Fellow. Um, and have you, have you guys heard of that? Who's heard of that? Raise your hand. Right. Chancellor's Research Fellowship. So I, um, I, I did a, my, I, my faculty mentor wasn't in the School of Public Policy, but he was actually in the Graduate School of Education. And um, he focused on like participatory action research, right? Um, and what that is, is like really puts research methodology upside down where instead of like, you know, thinking like as a, as a researcher, like, oh, I know the answers or, you know, you, you set the assumptions or you kind of, um, you kind of do the, you know, you, you build the research design, you really have to engage the community or whoever you're researching with to, um, to figure out what that is, you know, and really involve them in the process. And um, even though it was kind of just like the, the intervention I designed was meant to be in a school classroom, a lot of this, a lot of this like understanding and, and thinking um, has sort of affected the way I look at policy, you know, like, um, you know, when I look at a bill or when when constituents bring something forward or I'm, I or I'm advising the senator on policies, you know, I'm really like, who, you know, what, why, you know, that the people who this is going to affect actually want this, you know, and then really like, um, can you can separate the the real from the BS, you know, um, when you have that that critical lens. So I I highly advise it. Um, they give you a pretty fly polo. Um, I would have preferred blue, but they got me gray. Um, and yeah, I don't really. I wish we had more community building with them, but um, you know, alas. And then I graduated, and then um, and then and boom, I was in the real world. Um, and so I was like, what do I do? Um, and so I, um, I think, I don't know, I ran into Violetta somewhere, some, somehow, um, but I knew, you know, Violetta and, and other people um, who worked in, in this field. And I was like, you know, what's what, you know, like, who do you know? What can I do? Um, and a research internship opened up with, um, with uh, SCIU, with the, um, I'm blanking on the name, Service Employees International Union. Um, and what, so that's like, that's the name of the international. Okay. So I'm going to go over this stuff. And then one to one RN was the local. Okay. Um, and I was like, all right, I did research in undergrad. I guess it's pretty similar. Not really. Um, this is what my, this is what one of the events looked like. Right. So, um, I, uh, worked for nurses, you know, these are folks who, um, oh my God, nurses do so much. How many of you guys been to the, the doctors lately or ever yeah like nurses like they do the work right you know doctors they may have that knowledge base and they my brother-in-law is a doctor I really value what he does but nurses do the work and their work is hard their job is hard um and uh one of the things they were fighting for was safe staffing ratios um and that you know and, and this is kind of how I learned about policy like and, and how it affects people in real life so these nurses were upset that um you know, we had laws on the books that dictated how many patients they should be having at any given moment, right? And and what that is meant to do is to, uh, you know, ensure that patient care is is good and that, you know, nurses aren't being burned out as they go along. But, um, you know, there's really no mechanisms for enforcement. And this is a huge problem in, in California of all, you know, states that we have these wonderful laws on the books, but there's really no one enforcing any of them. But if you're in a union and you have a collective bargaining agreement, you know, with your employer, um, you can file grievances. You can you can go on informational pickets. You know, you can scare the crap out of your boss into respecting you. And um, you're not just an invisible number on a spreadsheet. You know, you're a real life person. And that's that's kind of what uh, drew me into into union work. You know, and it is hard. It is rough. Um, it is not always easy, and sometimes you even fight your own coworkers. And I, you know, like it, it happens. Like, and it, it's the people get really passionate about it. Um, and but you know, alas, it was an internship, 
it eventually ended. Um, but throughout this time as well, um, another person that I was really engaging with who was coming up was uh, um, Assembly Member Sabrina Cervantes. Um, and she is the current Assembly Member for the 58th District. So this was the old map, but this is the map that I worked, right? Um, and so we had Corona, we had Eastvale, Harupa Valley, Norco, parts of Riverside, um, kind of ended right around, it, we didn't have UCR, that was uh, Jose Medina, but then we also had some unincorporated communities as well. Um, and she had an opening in her office, and guess what? I, I was one of her first volunteers. You know, I was one of the first people who showed up on a random Saturday to canvas for her in Eastvale, and I built relationships with folks who um, were on her campaign, you know, and, and people who she worked with. And, you know, when I applied for the job, um, you know, it, it didn't, I'm not going to say I was a shoe in because I don't know what that internal process is like. We're hiring people in our office, and I'm like, whoa, this is complex. But I don't, I don't think it hurt that I knew her beforehand. Um, and, you know, um, this was a selfie. Um, I would, and before, I, you know, I was in Sacramento, I just, you know, write a note to her, say hello every now and then. Um, and then this was me on my last day. You know, my, uh, my district director, Rachel, at the time was like, take this photo. You're going to remember this. And this was my last, this was my last day with the office. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. Um, this, I was, I worked for her during COVID. Um, and so, you know, the work was from, went from in-person to kind of remote. Um, you do a lot of casework for, for constituents when you work in the district office of, of, a, um, of an elected official, you know, so you put out fires that your boss in Sacramento will never have to deal with, um, but you also help people in the process, right? So um, one of the folks that I helped with, um, she was an elderly woman who lived in, in, an, in a manufactured home, right, in, an, in like a, in, a, in a trailer park. And her house was falling apart. And, you know, she's like, where, you know, what do I do? Um, and I, you know, Googled her problem. I found a government program that provides, um, you know, home repairs for low-income seniors. And I got her 35, I got her a new roof. I got her a new toilet, new plumbing, new foundation. And she'd have to pay a cent. And the, the you know, the, you know, and I helped her understand it. So, you know, when you work for an elected official, you really, you're, you're like a, you're like a special assistant to her constituents. I say her because I've only worked for women actually um, and women of color, which is really rare, but um, really grateful for that. So you you are like that first line of um, contact. So I do similar things for the Senator, but it's a bit, it's a bit different. Um, but then, you know, all jobs eventually lose their luster. You're like, you reach a point where you're like, okay, you know, I've, um, I've really exhausted my growth here. I've, um, sort of, um, you know, I'm a, little, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit burnt out, not going to lie, you know, having people yell at me about their EDD cases is a pandemic. So people were, um, you know, people, people are still anxious. You know, you go on the streets, you know, people drive like crazy, you know, we're still feeling reeling from those effects. And so I had, to, I needed a change. So I decided to move on to grad school. And uh, I was like, Riverside, I love you, but um I want, I want, I want to change the scenery. So I went to UCLA, um, and uh, you know, I wanted to deepen my uh, connection with labor, and so I was looking for a graduate student researcher position, GSR. Um, if you're an undergrad or if you're a grad student, you may know about that um, position within the labor center. Um, and this was, this is my bike. I love her. Um, this is an e-bike motor. Hold on, let me, let me just. So that's a that's a that's a key bike battery. That's the hub. I made it myself. It's not there anymore. Um, I have an acoustic bike. I, well, the bike, yeah. I mean, just installed it, but I took it off because it was a little dangerous. Oh, it's a fun. It's fun. It goes fast. Um, but then I got hit on it, so I was like, mm, probably not the best idea. But you know, um, it was fun. You know that you should have seen the Tesla that hit me. That was like a three thousand dollar bill for that car, and he's trying to get me to pay for it. I was like. Talk to lawyers, but okay. Anyway, um, LA is fun. I, I the what? Hard seat. Hard seat. Yeah, that is un, that is not comfortable, but it's fun. You you were, you were padded um clothing. So a little bit about my work with um at the labor center. So my project director at the time uh, was Lola Smallwood Cuevas, and the care at work is stands for 
the Center for the Advancement of Racial Equity at Work. Um, and this was a center that was primarily designed for black workers in um, in labor, right? So specifically around um, kind of uh, occupational segregation, right? Um, we see black workers are often, you know, kind of locked out of lucrative blue collar professions that don't need a degree, like, you know, the, the trades um, and particularly uh, the water sector is what I was working on. And um, my and my my boss um, is huge in the labor world. I didn't know this about her, but she established the uh, first LA uh, the first Black Worker Center in the country in Los Angeles. And then um, that they went on to find find uh, the SoCal Black Workers Hub, which founded the Inland Empire Black Workers Center, which is here, um, not not at UCR, but it's in San Bernardino. And you know they needed someone who knew about the IE. So I was like, I know about the IE. That's amazing. So literally, like, um, one of the things that I that I you know kind of provided support for was uh, the Inland Empire uh, Black Worker Center, their um, their uh, apprenticeship program in their pre apprenticeship program in the water sector. So if you guys know something about the trades, you probably don't because you're all in you're on uh, university, right? You went the other way. But it's really important to know because um, you know typically when you start off in a in a trade. You start off as an apprentice, right? But who knows about those apprenticeships? Did you know about those apprenticeships when you guys were thing? No, typically it's it's kind of a gate gate kept profession, and it has it built that culture because of this idea that you know um, we need to protect our wages, we need to protect our jobs, and it was a scarcity mindset. So I don't blame those workers who did do that, but you know, in, in a way, there's there's kind of this there's like I said, there's internal conflicts within labor itself, right? And if you if you remember from your history classes. You may know that you know unions were kind of racist when they first came up, right? Like they wouldn't let black people in their ranks, they wouldn't let Irish people in their ranks, you know, they wouldn't let white people in their ranks. You know, if you were the wrong kind of white, you couldn't be in. So that that they were they were really exclusionary. So um, you know, the, these kinds of programs are really important for um, you know, to to beat that. So um, you know, and I part of my work was to you know look at data, but to also interview workers, right? And so um, this is Juanita Fawcett. Um, she is a graduate of the program, you know, um, and she was one of the workers that I interviewed. Um, and, you know, like, you know, you don't see women like her in jobs, in, 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 in those kinds of jobs, you know, and, and it's like, it's like, why not? You know, what, what, what makes those jobs inherently exclusionary to women, you know, uh, apart from the fact that they, they face, you know, harassment and other things that can be solved. Um, and at the same time, these these professions face a really strong um, uh, they, they face shortages now because they can't find enough workers who have the skills to get them in. So that crisis sort of became our opportunity in a way. Right. Um, and so that's how this program was able to get off the ground. Um, and this is uh, the, the report really fancy um, cover that I wrote over two years as a grad student, um, just you know, trying to elevate it. Um, and I think I think that, that sort of speaks to one thing that things can happen, but if the story isn't captured and if it's not told, it's almost like it never happened. You know, this is a this is a report that um, the IE Black Worker Centers, IE Black Worker Center shows to funders and shows to donors, you know, like donate to us, we can get things done. So it it um it it's really important. Um, yeah, I can go on. And now she's a state senator, which was crazy because in the middle of my program, she's like, hey, y'all, I'm running for office. You'll see me a lot less. Um, but, you know, she 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 ran for the state Senate um, and, you know, she represents one million people um, like all state senators do. I think that's more than members of Congress. Um, Lola is, um, Senator Smallquavis, is second to um, you know, statewide officers, right? Um, and and for someone like her to you know enter a seat like that without you know glad handing, without you know running for city council and doing this, but she came up as an organizer. So I you know really feel um, like she's someone who whose values align with my own. Um, and this is her signing one of the bills that I worked on called SB one hundred and fifty with the governor, um, and. Um, and yeah, uh, that, that's where I work now. So it's 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 been um, quite a journey. Um, 
but I'll, I'll get into the next part of my um, seminar now. Are there any questions before I kind of go on? I feel like, I'm talking, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to UCDC this summer, you're asking if I have any advice. So I know that the summer is very humid, and it's very hot, and you're going to, there's a saying in DC called drain the swamp, it, it was built on swamps, it was built on like a swamp land, so just for the weather, um, do you have your internship lined up yet, or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And um, so what what do you want to work in? Okay. Like the DOT, the ideally with a federal agency. Okay. So um I mean the federal you want to get those applications in very soon because I think they they they're hiring uh their hiring uh cycles are a lot sooner. So if y'all want to think about DC, think about where you want to go, because, you know, um, if you're, if you're like me and you wanted to do a congressional office, you know, um, we run, they run on coffee, they run on um, like kind of just fumes. Uh, and, you know, you may, I, I was getting like uh, interview calls, like, like two weeks into my program, uh, but agencies are much different, much different type of culture very like methodical, very like, um, okay, now we filled out this form, now let's do that form, you know, but but they do that for a reason. And you'll realize why every workplace runs a little differently. But um, so think about that. Um, um, has anyone else done UCDC yet? No, okay. Um, any other questions before I move on? So. Uh, I know that you, I know you mentioned that you work for women of color, um, and since, you know, that's women of color is severely underrepresented in politics, I don't know, like, what was it like working for women of color, like, were there any barriers you faced? Oh, my God. You're asking a man that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, it, you know, like, like, Barbara Lee, um, when she called for that, um, um, when she opposed that war after 9-11, um, she got death threats. There were, like, people outside her door, like, trying to, um, like, kill her. Or, um, well, they had Secret Service and Capitol Police there, but people wanted to kill her. And I would answer her phones, and people would give death threats over the phone, and I'd have to be like, all right, let's, how do I do this? You know, how do I, and, you know, I don't think other uh, you know, non women of color um, get that kind of attention, you know. Um, Sabrina Cervantes, uh, I worked for her when she went on maternity leave. She was having triplets. And she's gay. And she represents the IE, you know, and she, she represented Norco at the time, which is a very conservative area. Um, and so, you know, um, and she was in a flip seat too. So she was, she's the first Democrat to hold that seat since the Civil War. Um, and, you know, her, um, her like um, courage, you know, she's, she has, uh, she, uh, you know, now, and she's running for a different position and now it's a dem on dem battle and um, that's hotly contested. Uh, but, you know, it was a, it was a very different time when she ran and, you know, all eyes were on her because the dem the Democrats had their super majority to pass the gas tax um, because of her. And everyone was like kind of sending things our way. And so when I worked for Sabrina, um, it was, it was a culture of intense perfectionism and for the right reasons, because we were under a microscope and every little mistake, you know, you would hear about it and um, constituents would be kind of passive aggressive, you know. Um, now, Lola, uh, Senator Smallwood Cuevas, um, and, and I sometimes I don't call, you know, like I don't call Congresswoman Barbara Lee by Barbara because I don't really know her like that. But then I knew Sabrina, I knew Lola before they were elected, so I may switch, but it's, it's full respect to them. Um, so, you know, Senator Smallwood Cuevas represents one of the last few remaining um, dense black areas of the state, you know, it's the uh, Crenshaw Corridor, it's South Los Angeles, uh, but it's also, and also South Central and Skid Row, and so, um, you know, very different type of crowd, very different type of policy that we're running, um, 
you know, not as much on the um, perfectionism, but definitely on what she, and she's also the only black woman in the Senate. So um, that's another huge deal. And you would think that in, in California, you know, it's not, but, um, you know, and, and in the Senate, it was a different culture. It's much more methodical. Um, so I think she also feels like, um, you know, uh, this intense pressure and this intense microphone, but in a, at a different level, more of a statewide level. You know, I think she, I think we get a lot of love from our constituents. Um, I think we're also, we're also a newer office too. So I, I joined Assembly Member Cervantes' office when she was, um, you know, in well into her second term. So it wasn't as like um, the procedures were established, but in this office, we're still establishing that. So it's, you know, it, it, it yeah, it varies. But yeah, women of color, I think, have a much harder time in politics because of, by virtue of their identity, you know? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Yeah, I, I, I gloss over a lot for the sake of brevity, but don't want to miss that. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the next portion is a bit more knowledge heavy. I'm not an expert by any means. Um, I only know what I need to know, meaning that um, when you work in, in, as a generalist like I do, you don't need to know everything about everything. You kind of need to know a little bit about everything. Um, but in, in that way, I may be editorializing some things. I may not be going into full detail, but that's just for the sake of the picture. So uh, of the story I want to make. So if you have questions or if something is lingering in your mind, um, please you know write it down and let me know. I'm going to just look at the time. OK, oh, we're good on time. OK, so what's a union anyway? And let's go about this beginner mind, because no one actually told me about this on my first day at SCIU. I was like, yeah, we work for the workers, but how does it work? What's the history? Um, and and what, what are the relationships? What are the, the big things? So this is a little bit about um, what I'm going to talk about. OK, so um, this is my sister um, and her husband um, and their baby. Um, and they have a relationship, right? So if you're the if you're my brother-in-law and my sister is the union, you know, um, she, you know, both of you make the collective bargaining agreement together. Unions, in most cases, are not, you know, they don't serve you. You don't serve the union. You know, there's this mentality of like, or they shouldn't at least. And some unions are different, but in in the way that I've explored unions and the way that it's most effective is that you have a robust membership who, and then there's there's a back and forth, you know, when there's conflict between the leadership, between the elected leaders and um, and, and the rank and file members, um, you know, you work it out, you know, you, you make it happen and you try to meet in the middle and you try to get the collective bargaining agreement because that is the bread and butter of what a union does, right? Um, I was in a union. Um, I was in I was in the U UAW Academic Worker Union, um, and I went on strike uh, in my last year, and I got arrested on the picket line. Um, I didn't. I'm not showing the video because um, that that would be, you know, you can see it on my Instagram. But um, you know, I got arrested. You know, um, and at the same time, you know, um, there's there's people your employer, right? They act in many cases. They actively don't want you to join. The union because it changes the nature of the relationship, right? And what I mean by this is that when you look at employment 101, right, there's two main forms of employment arrangements in the U.S. There's at will and there's contract. Um, the majority, I think 90% of workers in the U.S. are at will employees, meaning that um, your, your employer can hire and fire you at will, you know, the if there's, um, you know, uh, there's less money one year, sorry, bye. Um, if the needs of the client change, sorry, bye. If they're downsizing, sorry, bye. Um, and yes, you are protected by anti-discrimination laws, the state and the federal level, but you need to seek redress through the courts. And that can take forever. And that's why we see so many injury um, billboards on, you know, um, on the freeways, because, you know, um, there's so many people who, who have issues with their workplace or, you know, um, can't get things done, but it, it takes forever. If you've ever had to go through that process, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, and on the other hand, there's there's a contract, there's contract employment, which is negotiated by by a union, okay? And um, the employer-employee relationship is supposed to be dictated by a collective bargaining agreement, meaning that um, you know uh, you your 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 the times that you work are set, the uh, overtime rates are set, the wages are set, um, and if there's any changes that they want to make to that arrangement, they need to go through 
um, contract negotiations or it needs to be, you know, negotiated between the union and, and the employee. Um, and, you know, if you feel like there's been a violation, you can file grievances through your union. So one thing I did at SCIU was um, one time, um, so we have charge nurses, right? And these are the nurses who are at the top of kind of like a nursing team. And then um, the management one day decides, oh, we're going to make a new program called clinical nursing coordinators, right? And we're going to say it's a management position. It's not technically a union position. But the duties between a CNC and a charge nurse are very, very similar. But guess what? They'll pay the CNC, the clinical nursing coordinator, the management nurse, a lot less than they would a charge nurse. Um, and as a cost-cutting measure, they would replace the work of the charge nurses with a clinical nursing coordinator, right? So one day, sitting at my desk, my boss hands me a, a, a you know stack of papers this thick. It's like, these are all the paper schedules that we have, you know? Um, and then they'll they'll make it really hard, you know, when you ask for information to, to process, right? But he's he hands me a, a file of papers papers this thick, and he says, "Look for the instances where they replaced our nurses with management's nurses." And so, looking, 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 I find the patterns, and I make enough, um, you know, I, I I get it, I get enough, you know, um, of a pattern going where we can file a grievance for it, you know. And um, the union brings it up to management in one of their meetings and says, "Hey." Look at this pattern. This is, you know, this is, you know, this is arbitrary. This is going against our contracts. You know, you're 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 um, getting our workers out of work, um, and they work it out and they make it happen. But you know, when you're a researcher, you may do things like that. You may research grievances. So um, that that's the really uh, good part about uh, you know grievances. And um, I, I tell this story from one side, um, and you know, because I work for unions, so. Um, if you're looking for an objective view of things, I'm probably not the best source. Um, and then this type of activity is protected by the 1935 National Labor Relations Act. So this was like, this was done way in the Great Depression when riots were happening. People like spilled blood for these types of protections to happen. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, because of this, it set up sort of like a traditional campaign model, right? Where you, the union campaigns in a place, right? So, um, have you have you guys seen like Norma Ray? Old movie. Um, but that's sort of like the old school unionism, right? Where um, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely watch it. It has um uh you know, like you'll have the union organizers like literally sit outside people's workplaces, like handing them flyers, just being like, here, look at this, look at this, look at this. And they'll try to get enough people involved, you know, get their whole unit going. Um and you know whether it works or not is you know, you know history will, will say but but yeah um, and then there, and then after that there's union recognition by a, a a national labor relations board or NLRB election or a union card drive which is a much less formal process but still get the recognition and then you get your first contract and then beyond the steps between these three are incredibly difficult and you will never know what you know how how hard it is until you do that work. Um, you know, you may see press releases, you may see headlines, but oh my God, like it is messy. Um, how messy? This messy. Like, you know, people were getting shot at because of their right to work, you know? And these weren't even like, and, and you can, you may be able to tell why these racist attitudes emerged with unionism, right? You wanted to protect your rights. You wanted to kind of get that going. And, you know, working class white people had this, you know, kind of, you know, like, oh no, we can't, we can't. We can't open this up. This will diminish our power, which is not correct. But you can see where you can see that thought process. But yeah, this is this is what happened. Um, and cool chart. I love I love showing charts. I get really nerdy. So on the on the left side is union membership, right? And um, on the I'm sorry, on the left side is union membership, um, and on the right side is income share of the top one percent. Okay. So look, you look at 1935 around this era. What starts to happen? You see union density going way, 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 way up. That's because of the National Labor Relations Act, right? Um, and then the income share, you know, inequality starts to go down a bit. Um, and then and kind of like this is what World War II here, right? Um, so after World War II, you see kind of a shift starting to happen. You see union density going down, 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 right? And this is what um, the 90s is when it kind of starts to equalize, right? It's when inequality starts to get really bad. Um, and you know now you know union density hovers around, oh say uh, what is that like a, on the right side 
Yeah, that's about 11%, okay? That, that's about where we're at. About 11% of workers in the U.S. are represented by union, right? That's like public workers, think of your, you know, postal workers, you think of cops, you think of firefighters, some nurses, but, you know, that, that it is what it is. Um, and then, yeah, then this income share of the top 1% is just skyrocketing, right? It is, you know, it's crazy. And and now, you know, most recently, um, the, the share of the top 10, oh, what's the the share of the top 10% is like 70% of the wealth. And then the next 40 is about 28. And then the bottom half is 2.8. You know, these are statistics that you may already know, but I think it's really important to kind of think about it in terms of like how our work arrangements work, right? Because, you know, most people in the US, you work for a living. How many of you guys have like a job, right? Yeah. So, and how many of you guys are union? Are you represented by union? None. And I bet. Yeah, at some point I was too, and I love my union job, but um, you know it, it it takes a hit. Um, so another thing that happened kind of throughout the '90s um, is this thing called NAFTA, is a free trade agreement. How many of you guys have heard of this in your classes? A free trade agreement, right? Um, does anyone want to like describe it? Do you want to just say what it is in a nutshell? Can you? Yeah. Between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, where I think it's the common market is like the African market, where it's just like little to no tariffs between countries. Yeah, exactly. And what this ended up doing was, um, you know, in the US, we had a thriving manufacturing sector, right? Um, and this was largely union, this was relatively diverse, right? Um, you need, you know, manufacturing jobs were, were pretty diverse at the time. Um, and it ended up sort of shifting a lot of these good union manufacturing jobs down to Mexico, right across the border, actually, to like Tijuana and inside Matiladoras, right? And, you know, you can resent foreign workers all you want, but these are not good conditions, right? Like these, these manufacturing jobs had great safety standards, they had health standards, they were union, um, but, uh, you know, all that went away. And, um, you know, in, a, in macroeconomic terms, right, the trade deficit between the U.S. and its, you know, um, partners kind of just went way up. So we weren't producing as much. We weren't. So this, this decimated our, our one of the core sectors of our um, union, um, of, our, uh, of our economy. And it ended up displacing almost 900,000 U.S. jobs. Like, that is a lot of jobs. You know, um, we have... You know, when you think about how many people actually work in this country, that is a huge sector. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, you, like I said, this just mentions the maquiladoras and uh, exactly what you said about the tariffs being eliminated between the three countries. So, um, and in Mexico lost their, their uh, thriving corn uh, uh, farming industry, or not even industry, it was just kind of like, um, it was, um, quite small scale, but, you know, our subsidized corn ended up displacing their domestic corn and a lot of farm workers, a lot of farmers in Mexico ended up losing their jobs. So everyone, you know, working people lost, um, but the people who owned capital sort of won. So I just want to give everyone a stretch break right now before I go into the next part. So maybe if you just want to get out of your seat, I like doing a little, you know, I, I, I think, was it that nice? Just like, Chilling. Yeah, it was. Great idea. I was getting tired just talking. Um, okay. How are we doing? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Is this interesting? Is it speaking to you? I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think about this history um, when I'm doing the work. You know, it's always quite. Um, it's like we just do the work, but then we forget. So um, I wanted to kind of ground a lot of things in, in theory, because um, I love that academic side, but I don't get to do it enough in my job. It's just emails and um, right now my phone's blowing up and Barack Obama wants another donation. You'll probably get those too, so that's fun. Okay, all right, so where was I? Manufacturing was on decline. But what's growing? And more importantly, you know, if you're a union, right, and your your business model, so to speak, your organizing model is, you know, based off of 
um, you know, economic activity, where do you go? You go to the sectors that are growing, right? And, um, you know, the, the manufacturing jobs during this era took a major hit from free trade agreements, right? And this offshoring was largely possible because of things like the internet and, you know, sophisticated technology and, um, uh, you know, also like policy and legal frameworks, right? We got a lot more conservative boomers, um, you know, ended up voting for Ronald Reagan and it was like a landslide election. And he had, you know, kind of like a, um, he had a, um, uh, it was a, it was a landslide election, like everyone went for him. Um, and it, and it was what it was. Um, um, and then, and yeah, and, you know, and historically, it also kind of brought to the forefront the idea of occupational segregation more, right? Like I mentioned about the, the public water sector, you know, we noticed how kind of homogenous a lot of industries were. Um, and, and what ended up growing were, um, was the public, was public employment, right? So what the water sector, um, public works jobs, um, such as, you know, um, you may think of large, um, the K line, you know, think of like large metro projects, um, freeways getting built. Um, those things still go on. You know, government spends a lot of money on that. University workers, um, right? Because people, everyone was like, go get a job or go go to college to get a job if you want to survive in this new in this new economy, right? So you saw a lot of administrators um, kind of coming up, but with that, you also saw a lot of clerks. You saw a lot of TAs, a lot of grad students, a lot of librarians. You know. Like jobs like that. Healthcare was another growing industry, right? We have an aging population. Um, we need a lot of workers to take care of, you know, um, our elderly folks. Um, and, you know, that's that's a huge challenge. Um, and then service, the service sector was another growing, growing industry. And, you know, um, you see a lot of unionization there, but historically, you know, Starbucks, McDonald's, hotels, you know, these were not these were not places you would think of as unionized, but that's changing today. Um, so yeah. So you know, remember that one arrow model that I showed you guys about the traditional union campaign? It's, it's completely changed now, right? We think about these things very differently, right? When a when a union, this is something that they don't just put on their website. You know, you got to take a class for it. <laughs> um, but you know, when you think about kind of like what you what you want to do with uh, um, with the union campaign, right? You think of your target employer, right? You think of the basic information. Where are they headquartered? What you know? What products do they sell? Do they sell a product or is it a service, right? Um, what kind of facilities do they have? Are they large? Are they multinational? Are they statewide? If you're like the UC, you have nine campuses um, statewide, you know, and your your product is is research. So where do you get your money from? That's a good question. Who's your workforce? Are they young? Are they old? Are they women? Are they white? Are they black? Are they Latino? Are they, you know, mixed race? Are they, you know, do they speak English is another one. What languages do they speak? Nurses, a lot of them come from the Philippines. They speak, you know, Tagalog and they speak other languages. There are a lot of H-1B workers too. Their financial information, you know, are they broke? Are, is this company going to go bankrupt next year? Are you going to run a successful union campaign only for them to declare bankruptcy after? Like, is that, you know, like, do you, where do you, where do you dedicate your scarce resources? Um, what's their history? Do they like unions? Do they not like unions? Um, were they bought out? Were they sold? What's their strategy? What are their growing sectors? You know, do you want to, you know, build, do you want to start your organizing efforts in a new sector or, or in a sector that's kind of in decline and it's probably going to be cut out and sold to another buyer? Or do you want, you know, do you want one of their core um, kind of products, right? So, there's a lot, it's very, it's quite vague, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, then you look at management, who's their CEO, you know, and who who holds power in that? How many, of you, how many of you guys seen Succession? Like, yeah, I love that show because it's so real, you know, that's how it works, you know, like Logan Roy may have stepped down from CEO, but he's still calling the shots from the back, you know, and that's what, that's the kind of things you need to think about, you know, you need to talk about, you need to talk to the decision makers, the stakeholders. Who are their investors? You know, is it like BlackRock, some private equity firm, or is it a pension, um, you know, like a, a statewide pension where you have more leverage, you know? Um, who's on their board? Um, who's the parent company? Uh, who are the competitors? What's the industry? Uh, where do they get their raw materials from and their supplies, you know? Transportation, procurement, are they a government? Do they sell to the government? Because that's a huge deal, right? Government can, can add regulations and can add, you know, certain 
um, things to their procurement rules that that make it so that they need to do that. Um, you know, environment. Who are the outside stakeholders? Is this company getting a lot of flack for environmental damage? You know, um, are they in hot water because they donated to Republicans or you know, or to Democrats for that matter? Um, you know, what kind of community are they in? Who like you know, what kind of regulatory and legal frameworks do they have to operate under? So, you know, when 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 you think of a union campaign now, it's much more broad. You know, companies are way more complex. They're multinational. You don't know who owns them. Um, and yeah, are they publicly traded? Are they privately traded? You know, all this can, all this really goes in, are things, and this, this is what union researchers have to think, okay? And so this is what you call a comprehensive campaign. Um, and uh, you just, you know, in the era of, like I said, the global capitalism, that, that NAFTA stuff, you know, governments can pull the rug under unions like that. Unions also need to kind of adapt to their strategies. And this is, this is one of the frameworks that um, has historically proven to be really good. Um, and so, um, so, so I mentioned, um, first about, uh, the hotels, right. And kind of, um, and Liam and I were, I think, or it was Raphael, we were talking about what's, what's big in LA, what's, what's a growing sector in LA, right? So when LA was deindustrialized, meaning that all the jobs from the manufacturing industry went abroad, um, things started to change, you know, how many of you guys go to LA for fun? Like, have you guys been to a concert in LA? How many of you guys maybe stayed at a hotel in LA? How many of you guys um, go to conferences in LA? How many of you guys like think of LA as like a, before you maybe moved there or you saw it in person, you were like, this is a wonderland, you know? I think of LA, one of the biggest sectors in LA is hype. Like it's so much hype. Um, and for better or worse, and I have thoughts about it and I'm like, these dang tourists. But anyway, you know, um, this was, this is the site of LA Live, okay? And LA Live came up in 2001. And if you think about where NAFTA was, it was just after NAFTA. Um, and if you think about, let me look at time too. Oh yeah, okay. Um, when you think about the area, right? So this is downtown LA. Um, and you know, the inner core is rather affluent um, and Skid Row is like right here, okay? And then this is a low income community. This is a low income community. This is starting to get gentrified around Boyle Heights, East LA. Um, same with this area is gentrifying Chinatown, gentrifying um, Echo Park, gentrifying. But LA Live is in the center of it all. So a prime real estate location, you know, you can't beat it. Like the, these real estate values, like you can't move, you can't offshore, you can't ship it off to get lower tariffs. So you have real leverage here in terms of the location, right? Um, and this is a close-up of it. I love maps, if you can't tell. You know, Olympic, Figueroa, like these are like, you know, you got, this is a metro line right here. So really good central spot. And so one of the earliest, so I mentioned the thing called community benefits agreement. How many of you guys remember what that was? Okay, so one of the earliest contemporary community benefits agreement campaign was reached in 2001 for LA Live. Um, and basically a diverse uh, community coalition, meaning not just unions, right? Not just unions fighting for uh, their bargaining agreement, but also like low income residents fighting for affordable housing, but also, you know, people fighting for a local hiring clause so that if you're gonna build a giant thing in their backyard, they get some kind of preference for being hired, right? Um, if you think about a lot of public works jobs, right? Some of these jobs, people drive all the way from, I, you know, there's like cops who drive from like outside of LA County to police LA. There's also people who fly into LA to, to work these jobs, right? So you wanna get some kind of leverage in for that. And so, um, yeah. So what a community benefits agreement is, is a private agreement between a community coalition and a developer. In exchange for community benefits, the a coalition agrees not to oppose a developer's project in their community, right? So talk about local hire clauses, inclusionary zoning is what, you know, if you want, want set aside, you know, if you're gonna build this 29 story, um, uh, apartment building in the middle of downtown, you got to make it so that at least poor people can live there, right? Um, and the leverage comes in the form of carrots and sticks, right? So I mentioned just by virtue of its location, that's a huge point of leverage, but there's also tax incentives that, um, how many you guys remember when um, Amazon was looking for their second headquarters? And everyone was like, here's a billion dollars. Here's, here's, we'll build a trade line for you. We'll do this, we'll do that. So local governments have that, right? They have um, direct grants. Um, there's also lawsuits and protests. And what that means is that um, these developers, 
you know, you need money. You, these are like billion dollar projects. You can't just get it from one source. You have to get it from many different places. And if you delay their timeline, you mess with their profits and they don't like that. So it is in their best interest to make sure that this development moves through. And there's also SQL lawsuits and that's a whole thing. Um, and it, it's really, it, get, it can get really ugly. And, you know, like I mentioned before, you know, these, the, the advantage of a community benefit agreement is that it's not just jobs, right? It's, it's a whole host of livability. Um, LA is very expensive for many, many people. Um, and, you know, um, it's not just, you know, it's not just on your working conditions, but it's also like a long-term quote unquote, greater good, so to speak. Um, so, yeah. So how many of you guys heard of Bidenomics? Right. So there's like $1.2 trillion coming in for EVs and all this stuff. Um, and then the CHIPS Act um, is for the semiconductor industry. And that's why we can't buy from China because China is our enemy, but we want to off we want to onshore these jobs. So the dynamic is changing now because we've realized that with COVID, you know, things, world events can destabilize our supply chain and it is not in the best interest interests of the US to be reliant on foreign partners, right, for this stuff. Um, but that also means that employers need to pay more. And the benefit of, and so that's actually how China developed their industries was that they received lots of government subsidies. So this was actually, so when like, you know, Republicans call it like socialist or communist, they're not wrong, but it is, you know, there is an element of capitalism to it because, you know, when you, when you, um, oh, oops, when you kind of subsidize the cost or when you kind of, Put up uh, when you front that money, right? You you reduce the risk of loss for other investors. So this this you know these public dollars. These are your these are this is your money. This is my money. Um, it's going to, towards private developers. You know it attracts private capital, and it, the hope is that they eventually, you know, form successful companies and you know make jobs and all this stuff. So you know this is a map of some of that early round of funding. Um, and you know these, you know these are. You'll notice they're agglomerated in the south, right? And why is that? It's lower minimum wage, less regulations, less drama. Um, you know, and, and and I think, but California also has its has its own strengths in that we are a research powerhouse. We have Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We have UCR. I was at I was in Imperial County just a couple months ago, and we're talking about there's like lithium in the ground that can be extracted, and it's UCR researchers who are doing that work. So like. You know, there's there's leverage, right? And we're trying to apply that same community benefits agreement framework to these billion trillion dollar investments in our state. And other states have done it too, you know. And it is a red blue divide because you know, while these red states are, are fine with, you know, you go down to South Carolina where my sister lives, you'll find BMW plants. Those workers make seventeen dollars an hour, and a lot less than the folks up here who live in Michigan and these blue states who have unions and union protection. So. You know, it's this, you know, and they're they're strategically moving here, but you know, we're even moving to the south. But I'll tell you about what we're doing in, in California. So, you know, like I said, while multinational corporations set up shop in Georgia or South Carolina, Silicon Valley and also I think Riverside and also the UC um research industrial complex, whatever you want to call it, and you know, San Diego, you know, they they attract these smaller battery manufacturers who, you know, work on creating better types of materials, right? So UAW, who I worked for, we signed a, a neutrality agreement with a manufacturer that researched a way to make batteries without cobalt. Cobalt is one of those really nasty uh, rare earth minerals that they mine in the Congo. Or they call them artisanal mines where like kids literally like are barefoot and, you know, extract kind of um, lithium or, uh, you know, cobalt from the ground that way. Um, and, you know, while their pilot lines are located here, you know, it's also, we'll hope that California, what GoBiz is trying to do, the government, the governor's agency is trying to get money for their commercial to, to set up shop here, you know, um, and they may be smaller, but, um, you know, we want to make sure they're union jobs. So one of the bills that I, um, that I worked directly on and, you know, that brought me into Senator Small LaCuevas' office was my, my value added, so to speak, is this really uh, large weight, um, you know, large scale bill called SB 150. Um, and it basically requires state agencies to craft guidelines for labor standards and community benefits for projects receiving more than $35 million in funding. So if you get $35 million from taxpayers, you gotta, you gotta make sure that, you know, the job, the working conditions are good and that the, you know, um, 
you know, you, you hire from the community and you give, you give low income people a chance at those jobs, at that training, at that, you know, type of lucrative sort of employment. Um, and Illinois has done something similar. I think a lot of other blue states that get, get this money are doing something similar. Um, it, and it's hard work because, you know, the people who are supposed to enforce this, these laws are not funded. So that's also part of our work is to rebuild that bureaucracy, right? To rebuild the Civil Rights Department, which was gutted in the 90s by Governor Pete Wilson. Um, this was the same guy who was like, oh, we don't want bilingual education. He also gutted the agency that's responsible for enforcing anti-discrimination laws. So, you know, it, it's sort of, and what I mean by, you know, and this was all from the Biden administration. So when people say the president doesn't do much, I don't believe that because, you know, these types of agency decisions come from the president. So it makes you think of the kind of like leverage that government agencies have in this realm. Um, and, you know, when you're when you're working in a, in a realm like this, it's not just clean cut policy, right? I'm not just cutting bills in Sacramento. I'm, I'm like, you know, going back and forth with these agencies, like, you know, about negotiating about what they need to do and what their work is going to look like in this in this process. And um, yeah, if, if you're interested in any of this stuff, you know, I can tell you about the organizations who do it, um, the, the people who run it. Um, it's, it's quite behemoth, um, but I think it's good. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. It was just kind of really messy, but yeah. Thank you. So what's next, Maestro? <laughs> Um, so up next, we will actually have time for a few uh, different audience Q&A questions. Um, unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes uh, remaining in the audience Q&A. So at this point in time, I'll welcome anybody in the in-person audience. If they have any questions, to please come up to the middle aisle and speak into the mic um, so our Zoom audience can hear you. And for those in our Zoom webinar audience, uh, please go ahead and feel free to input your questions into the Q&A function and my fellow ambassador. Um, Pia will raise her hand to pose your question to our speaker directly. Um, so at this point in time, if anyone would like to come up to the mic and pose uh, off our first question, and I think we should be able to fit roughly maybe three or four questions in. Oh yeah, please feel free to come on. Thank you. I was wondering like how the contracts do you mitigate or account for maybe the process of training the locals for these jobs that require quite a bit more hands-on training by people that have been experienced for many years that are not in the community, but that need to be hired long-term. Oh, that Just to give a quick background, I worked in a company that came from South America uh -huh. to, to build a period of smear factory on kind of the plastic, the plastic mm -hmm. We initially thought we were just gonna need a few engineers uh, to train the, the people to run a machine that is plastic cups, but it ended up that we have a lot more people to come from the company that's making the cups to come here and be there in the ships with these people, training them for a year, two years to really build that long-term knowledge that is necessary. So I was wondering like how in this contract do you mitigate or account for those shifts? Oh that that's a great question. Um so like I like so remember what I mentioned about the building trades? how they have their apprenticeship programs that their brothers and their sons and their cousins know about. Um, that's a great, that, that, so the, the workforce development aspect of it is a lot, is some unions build their leverage through that. And so the, the um, you know, one of the agreements that I helped sign with Sparks, this, uh, you know, new era battery manufacturing company is that UAW will set up that. Um, that manufacturing program and they're going to do it in a way that um you know they have and they, think about it this way they also have their workers in michigan who work on ev stuff and so they know you know like the like when you work on um advanced battery materials and electricity there's like risks of like arc flashes and like you know people can die and this is like very dangerous stuff so um you know part of it is uh, uh the the union kind of negotiates like we'll we'll train these workers we'll get our workers in um, and they work with legislators like mine who are keenly, you know, looking out for their constituents, right? Black Californians who live in deindustrialized cities who don't have access to these jobs, right? 
Um, and so, um, you know, the did I answer your question? It's kind of like the the unions kind of they work out in their neutrality agreement is that's their value added that they bring in the workers. This is so Joe Manchin. You know, you guys all know who Joe Manchin is, right? The senator from West Virginia, who's like you don't know if he's a Republican or if he's a Democrat, but whatever. One of his kind of things when um, when this bill was signed is that he got his there's there's coal mine workers in West Virginia who would stand to lose their job in this transition, right? He signed he had he helped kind of get this agreement between the United Mine Workers and um, Sparks, the company that we signed with, and on the West Coast to be like our displaced workers are going to work in your factories and we're going to make sure that they have the training. So it, it, it kind of, um, we, we saw that we were like, Oh, that's a great way to do it. So it, the unions. Yeah. And I, and that's the thing I like, I'm, you know, I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know like what the training looks like, but that that's, that's part of the leverage is that they have that training and you, and I'm sure you know how expensive training is, right? Like it, it's one of those really big costs that, can make or break um, businesses, especially in, in manufacturing. So, yeah. Well, thank you for um, a very good question. Thank you for a very, very insightful answer. Um, so I've been informed that we have two uh, online Zoom audience questions. So without further ado, I'll welcome Pia up to the mic to ask those questions. So the first question is, how can a private sector company unionize successfully and what will be a selling point? Um, so I will say, uh, the, the workers want, should want the union for themselves, um, and that there should be, um, and oh my God, like, this is where, this is where, like, I, my knowledge base is limited because I've never actually, like, done new organizing before, um, and it is incredibly difficult, but I would say, um, you know someone in a union reach out to them if you if you know kind of like if, if you want to be in a union talk to your co-workers you know have that conversation from the beginning um like people who you know and then know that you can potentially you know know the risks too you could you know you may lose your job you may do this you may do that but um ultimately you, you'll improve your working conditions um but i guess it would depend on the sector um and I'd be happy to put them in touch if they do want to unionize with someone, but um, yeah, not not a very good answer, but yeah. And our second question from Michael Garner was, uh, would it be beneficial to have policy mandating a percentage of manufacturing or warehouse workers to be union shops, perhaps tying it to government contracts or development funds, for example, the budget? Oh my God. I. I... I heard warehousing and unions and um, development. And um, one of the reasons why I left Riverside, um, and uh, I hope like none of the board of none of the supervisors of the board are listening or you know, city council members, but it's it's you know, you in order to get these community benefit agreements signed, you need to have elected officials who have that vision, you know, who have that understanding that like your residents aren't just, you know, disposable, you know, cogs in a machine. Like I, and and I and I say that because I knew people who worked in Amazon warehouses, and I knew and I knew what it did on, and I know the number it did on their bodies, like repetitive stress injuries. You know, um, you got to pee in bottles, like, and and so yeah, I think I think it would, but the harder question is how do you get those people elected? You know. And and how do you get people to to understand what it means? You know, like land use policy is like, how many of you guys have seen like one of those like random pieces of paper, like like liquor license coming up here or like a new development? And you're like, what is that? You know, people don't know who who are on their planning boards. People don't know their city council members. And so it, it it's one of those bigger, I think, problems that, um, you know, we think about Congress, we think about president. We also need to think about the down ballot people, you know, um, cause they eventually represent, um, you know, they make these decisions that like, you know, th th that's why there's a new Amazon warehouse on every corner and the jobs aren't unionized. And, and there's a warehouse workers, um, policy, um, center. I think that's what the or, or, warehouse workers resource center is they have, they do great work around that. Um, and they try their best, but it is, I would say it's much, much harder to unionize, um, 
to, to build a union after the fact, after a development has gone in. And, and here's the thing is that when you do do that, it's not that, you know, the work, the union just takes, comes in and, you know, takes over that employee, right? Or the, that unit. Oftentimes it's just a new child agreement. It's just kind of like a, spit, a, a handshake that says, we're not going to put up these, these, you know, these flyers in our break room. We're not going to threaten our workers with firing. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. It, you still have to organize the union. You still have to get that mass consciousness going. You still have to do a car drive. You know, you still have to do that hard work. So, um, yeah, in, in cases where like it's, it's a high skilled industry where you can train your workers, it's a little different, you know, but um, it would depend. But that's what I said. That's that, that's that whole comprehensive campaign thing. You have to look at your points of leverage and, and where you can go in. Yeah. I don't know. I get really excited about this stuff. So. You mentioned um, like both NAFTA and the fact that like Audubon chose to develop in like the southern U.S. instead of elsewhere. Do you think that there's a lot of potential for unions to represent people both like with between states and also between like nations potentially? Oh, that is. Oh my God, these questions are so good. So there's this really great organization called Jobs to Move America, and um, and and that's very true because we live in the United States, right? Like things move between different places. And, and one of the boxes on that strategic chart was locations, right? So what, what Jobs to Move America did with New Flyer, which makes school buses, um, is that there's, there's new uh, supply lines going for electric buses, right? And they're being sold, you know, to blue states, right? Because these are the people who, you know, I mean, I have my views about EVs, but, you know, um, they, they're the ones who buy electric buses. So it, it kind of, um, you have that leverage when, when, um, you know, starting now that now that our economy is so interconnected, and I know that even in um, even across the border in Mexico, like they have, you know, um, international unions going. Like UAW is, has a presence there. They're you know trying to engage workers. It's just it's just that much harder when um, and you got to just think you you have to do that much more research when when you're that much removed from you know um, from a, from a you know from a friendly area or a place that you know like doesn't have. Um, and LA wasn't always union friendly, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was kind of was a little conservative in the beginning and then it's, you know, it's, it's shifted now and it's, you know, you might even think it's progressive now and it is, but it, it, it there's a pendulum. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, oh, go ahead. But unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions for today. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, but I would like to take I would like to take this opportunity to thank Umar Sohail for joining us today. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure to feature you on our UCR School of Public Policy Community Service and Alumni Spotlight. We are so proud of you and all your work. Thanks for sitting through my rants. Like I feel like the like the guy from like he's like pointing here, pointing there, like, <laughs> like look at that, or like, just see that, like so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm here for a little bit. So if you guys want to chat too, like just chat. Of course. Yeah. And then also I would like to thank our audience members as well for joining us today. Um, so I hope you that uh, you come and join us at our next School of Public Policy event. Uh, we have a few upcoming events. So on February 28th, we'll be hosting a seminar with Violeta Aguilar Weirich, principal at Zara Consulting. Um, which is very exciting on February. She's 20th, right there. Yeah, she's right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on February 29th, we will host our annual policy debate, which will be on homelessness, a very pressing issue in Riverside. And on March 4th, we will host a seminar by Samuel Roberts, communications officer at San Diego Association of Governments. So you can learn more about events like these and others um, at UCR at the School of Public Policy by visiting our website at spp.ucr.edu. And while you're there, you can also learn about our Masters of Public Policy program, as well as our BA slash MPP combined um, program. So additionally, you can watch our official policy chats uh, podcast series, Policy Chats. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and I wish you all a great rest of your day. Please um, get some refreshments on the way out, um, and have an amazing day. Thank you all. And thank you to our wonderful MC, Dr. Not easy, and and production and the ambassadors like it's hard work. Hard work. Oh.